My waking dreams express the magnificence of female beauty as surreal sculpture. The brilliance of her eyes and skin shines glorious. My love burns hot as hell and is punished as an immutable sin. My love is criminal, it is blasphemy, it is forever. Sunsets often remind me of a girl back there, a reminder as ethereal as the fragrance of flowers wafting in the open hatch above my bunk. I wondered, as time passed, did she also feel nostalgic about me? Did a sail on her horizon ever cause her a second wistful look? Well, days of glorious sailing. A little rough. Calmer days ahead, I'm sure. About halfway to the Bahamas now. Riding this cold front, the wind's going northeast. We're heading southeast and soon to turn south. Final approach. We may arrive at the islands and reefs in the darkness tomorrow night, so we'll have to slow down or heave to before we get in there too close, if the wind holds. As we approach the Bahamas, James readies himself for something he's been planning to do for the past few years, since his mother Helen passed away. He also has some healing to do, as he expresses in his book, Bound for Distant Seas, where he writes about his emotions as a son 
to his mother and the role she played in his journey. I convinced myself that no one really needed me back home, though that wasn't completely true. My recently divorced mother probably felt differently about my hurried departure to begin an open-ended second circumnavigation only a few months at home. I was her only child. She never spoke of her needs and I was too self-absorbed to ask. She understood my compulsion to follow rainbows and seek the poetry of life just as she had done in her youth and she outwardly encouraged me to undertake this voyage because she knew it was what I had to do. My life has been wonderful, my mother told me as I gripped her hand on her deathbed. You're here now and I'm at peace to know we'll go through this together. I had finally returned like the prodigal son to be at her side for her last days, to put both our souls to rest. I finally realized I was also there to seek forgiveness and complete my own cycle of redemption. In a short time, I understood I cried not over the inevitable cycle of life and death, but from the suddenly awakened guilt of a wayward son brought to death's confessional. There is always a toll to pay on freedom's road. One of the things I came out here for on this trip was to release my mother's ashes into the Gulf Stream. Journey well, Mom, and rest easy. It was time to release my mother's ashes into the sea. She had loved to sail with me on short passages in earlier years. Now we took our final passage together. Leaning over the lee rail, I poured the contents into the sea with a trembling hand and a full heart. The swirling wind brought a mist of ash into my eyes and lungs as I laid her to rest on the edge of the Gulf Stream. As the water carried her away in the endless cycle of Atlantic currents, the good memories flooded back to me. I was thankful and at peace. Here I was in Munich with my then German girlfriend and her family. They claimed to be a sailing family. I knew the parents didn't support our relationship and I saw it was doomed to fail. At our final dinner with the family I made a dramatic toast, announcing my pledge to solo sail around the world as a tribute to these judgmental landbound sailors. They coldly brushed me off, no doubt thinking, no way in hell. I wonder how much my bloody-minded grievances against the world fueled my determination to sail away. My brain cried out for freedom. Reading James' books dripping in nostalgic patina and romantic prose and his succinct anti-Western 
work ethic sentiment added fuel to my fire. Looking back, it seems I was only seeing my own story in his words, rather than the true James, who I came to see is more positive in his outlook than my intentions wanted him to be. In a way, I was looking for a hero to help me blast my demons to bits. Erasing myself from the center of the universe, I see that my anger and pain lie within me and the once perceived toxic forces around me are merely my own projections. I have the nervous habit of checking the gauges of my Westerbeka engine the way James would scan the horizon for squalls. Although having a diesel engine gives me some comfort, I've been relying on her too much. I know James would scoff at how motoring any time the sailing is tough because it robs you of the pure sailing experience and hinders learning seamanship skills. The readout on the radar gives me a digital representation of Baja Mexico coastline. Radar's usefulness as an aid to navigation and for collision avoidance and its ability to track thunderstorms is weighed against their power drain and chance of breaking down. And James has warned me not to become a gadget sailor that can't directly interpret the world around them. Nacho and Lucas sleep to the drum of the engine while the electronic autopilot steers. Mainsail is raised to steady boat and take advantage of slight winds. My trusty dinghy hangs on for a ride as the untested boat and crew push forward. Note to self, don't tow dinghy in unprotected waters again. I embrace the living nature around me as I take in the awesome landscape of the Sierra San Pedro Martir mountain ranges. We head for Punta Canoa anchorage tonight. Entering Punta Canoa from the open sea is a surreal experience. Being here reminds me that this truly is the beginning of something big in my life. Anchored just off the arroyo, coastal birds fly in circle, awaiting paying of fishermen's evening return home with daily catch. I look out from the cliff line to the empty sea knowing that there is so much more to come. So we're gonna miss it or what? Looks like we may have, may have to give it a miss. This narrow channel is only about 10 feet deep at the deepest point. And we've got six to eight foot waves rolling into it. And so it could be breakers right across the entrance. We wouldn't be able to get in. So what's our ultimate plan now? Well, there's no other islands to leeward of this, except to end up in Florida. So if we don't hang out here all night waiting for a wind shift tomorrow that might come, then we could just turn downwind run back to a port in Florida, get a rest over there. At this point in our passage, our plans, as well as my expectations, have fallen apart. The rebellious waves that carried me away from sedentary life in the city have come crashing down against the reefs of raw nature. Lofty agendas and landbound dilemmas now take a back seat to the basic duties of the sailor, where practical choices are made to ensure safe passage. The envisioned paradise in our future, as well as settling scores with the past, are erased from my mind. The voyaging sailor has a present and single-minded goal to sail through troubled waters 
cleansing away useless thoughts unrelated to direct matters at hand. Suddenly, our problems are no longer trivial, but rather elemental. A simple observation looking out over the bow to scan the horizon holds urgency. Plotting a logical course around storms and following the basic principles of passage planning become as automatic and as essential as breathing air into our lungs. That particular island of our dreams that would welcome us to its protected shores and heal our wounds no longer exists in our heads at all. It remains but is no longer ours. Just as finding your way home, there are worthy islands at all points of the compass that will serve our purpose. Atom's bow was now heading towards a new landfall, closer to home. <laughs>